Um, everyone, welcome to the first history department uh, seminar for 2023-24. Um, many thanks to Russell for organizing it and to all of you for coming. Um, it is my very great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Jason Opel. He is professor of history at McGill University, also currently in the in the graduate school department as a dean, but these things happen. Um, Jason is another American teaching U.S. history to Canadians, so welcome to that fun club. Um, his corner of U.S. history is the social, legal, and political world of colonial North America, as well as the Caribbean. He has, at times, a concentration on the American Revolution, but moves into the 19th century, as you will see. His first book is called Beyond the Farm about ambition, the idea of ambition in rural New England, though it stretches far beyond rural New England. It's a cultural and social history of ambition that follows six men's paths to, well, sometimes to success. There's a lot of failure in there, too. Not all. Their ambitions are not all realized. His second book is Avenging the People, Andrew Jackson, The Rule of Law and the American Nation. And in Opal's words, it takes Jackson as a main character rather than a subject to think about law as a tool of vengeance and perhaps even as vengeance itself and how law, venge vengeful law, came to define the American nation. The Times of London called it one of the best summer books of 2017. And I thought, wow, that's a, it's a great book, but that's an interesting summer read. If you like nightmares, that's a good book. Um, right now, Jason is working on two projects, the first one on Barbados. Um, and that project gives quite a bit of time to the histories of smallpox and yellow fever on the island. His second related project is a history of epidemics in early America. And for much of this project, he's collaborated with his father, Dr. Stephen Opel, who's a professor of medicine, um, a specialist in infectious diseases. So you can see some overlap there. The two of them have published articles together, which I think is really quite great. And today he's going to share some of that work. His talk today is Rumors of the Apocalypse, the Epidemics that Shaped and Did Not Shape, British America, 1600s to 1776. Please welcome, join me in welcoming Dr. Oprah. Thank you, Roseanne, very much for that very kind introduction and for the invitation to come here to speak to you today um, about uh, topics of, of endless curiosity, um, but also topics of great darkness. And I'll, I'll try at the end of this to come to some degree of um, optimism or, or light. So as soon as Europeans began making narratives of America, began settling in America, and then telling stories about America, they noted in various ways, with various degrees of seriousness, that the indigenous peoples that they had encountered uh, were dying at shocking rates. Sometimes this is said in a very vague sense. Other times it comes with a more menacing undertone. So I'll just give you one example. Uh, John Smith, one of the early leaders of Massachusetts, says, it seems God had provided this country for our nation, destroying the natives by the plague. And you find many, many other quotations like this or primary sources like this in which some sort of plague, often described as the plague, was causing indigenous peoples that had been encountered in the Americas to disappear. Modern scholars who have want nothing to do with narratives of conquest or narratives of providential replacement of one nation by another nonetheless sometimes fall into the same pattern in which the apocalypse, the mass death of huge numbers of human beings, was rendered in vague illusions rather than in precise detail or honest narration. So the scale of the, of the epidemic diseases seems to be so vast and so massive, yet the details about those epidemics so thin and controversial that it leaves us with this unsettling sense um, of unreality, of a rumor of apocalypse, rather than a history of apocalypse, of, of kind of illusions or references to the unimaginable, rather than to honest reckonings with those events. Most recently, for example, scientists, more than historians, have looked at the archive, the ultimate archive, the archive of the globe itself, and wondered if the scale of death 
among indigenous peoples of the Americas was so vast that it partly caused the Little Ice Age. The theory being that so many people died and so many cultivated fields disappeared and were replaced by forests that huge numbers of trees absorbed more CO2, expelled more oxygen, and enabled the sun's rays to bounce more efficiently back into the space, the opposite problem that we have now. Which is to say that the scale of death was so vast it changed the climate. The mind boggles at such rumors. The mind stuns at such um, possibilities. My goal today is not to try to resolve such issues, it's not possible to do so. Uh, the three things I want to do is first to revisit uh, the virgin soils so-called theory, or the belief that um, the indigenous peoples of America were destroyed by virgin soil epidemics. And I want to do a review of the historiography uh, of the last uh, 50 years and get a sense of what that means or doesn't mean. Um, the second thing I want to do is talk about a disaster or a plague that did not occur in early America and to really get a sense of that and, and get, get a, in some detail about why uh, that event did not occur. And then finally and relatedly, I want to talk about the, the rise of a kind of ideology or um, a theory about America that posited America as being uniquely healthy and free of plagues. And I'll conclude by saying that something about the, the, the link between that uh, and the American Revolution. So let me first start with the idea uh, of the so-called virgin soil idea. The, uh, and I'll give you one primary source that is the origin of this. So if you listen, this is uh, a Franciscan friar writing in the 1530s about what happened in what is now Mexico. Quote, the first plague, note the words, the first plague was an epidemic of smallpox. It broke out in this manner. On one of Cortez's ships came an African slave stricken with smallpox, a disease that was unknown in this land. When the smallpox began to infect the Indians, there was so much sickness and pestilence among them in all the land that in most provinces, more than half the people died. Okay, that's like one paragraph and that's it. This is written in the late 1530s and then it's passed down as an explanation for what occurred to indigenous peoples of Mexico. The Spanish, because they were concerned about converting people, expressed some concern about this. The, the English who came later con conveyed less interest. And what has then come down is this idea of a so-called virgin soil epidemic, especially of smallpox, that is largely responsible for these apocalyptic events. The term virgin soil itself dates from the 1970s when uh, historian Alfred Crosby described and used that term virgin soil to explain why it was that old world epidemics, especially of smallpox, were, were so uniquely deadly to indigenous peoples. So um, Crosby himself was very sensitive to the social dimensions of epidemics. He was actually quite interested in the ways that actually it was social factors and the violence of colonialism that was actually causing some of these events to occur. But as we often know in history, what happens is a catchphrase like virgin soil epidemics is the thing that is remembered, the thing that is recalled and, and replicated. Thank you very much. Perfect. The, the, the blame largely falls. So what happens is the virgin soil concept from the 1970s gets simplified into, so basically indigenous peoples didn't have immunity to these pathogens, and they died therefore at horrific rates, more so than Europeans did. That's the argument boiled down, and the argument became more simplified than Crosby himself won. Right? It's very common in history. People take the idea and then kind of simplify it. The, from the 70s until recently, I would say, it's gotten even more simple, and it's basically like smallpox did it. Right, so the, the, the basic idea is that um, when thinking about some disastrous population decline, such as, for example, the Taino of Hispaniola, who probably numbered definitely in the hundreds of thousands, possibly as many as three million in 1492, were numbered in the hundreds by the 1530s and 40s. And now the general explanation for that, again, the kind of use of the simplified idea of the virgin soil epidemic is smallpox did it a rod-shaped enveloped DNA virus that has a number of different viruses that are related to it. And there's, there's this, this theory that's so simplified has become problematic and resulted in or was uh, sort of replaced by um, or challenged in a 2003 article called Virgin Soils Revisited, in which the historian said this is all kinds of problems with this theory. Okay, so first of all, what do you mean, virgin soil? What do you mean, indigenous peoples were immunologically immune or, 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 or more vulnerable? Are you suggesting that there is a difference in the immune response? Are we suggesting something about the immune systems of various people? What is the argument being made when we say 
that there was no immunity in a population. Number two, are you sure it was smallpox? Because a lot of the times when there's the descriptions of these events, they're very vague. They use allusions to different diseases, and they don't necessarily describe very accurately or honestly what was happening. So maybe it wasn't just smallpox. And then finally, and most troubling, this uh, author, David Jones, said, the virgin soil's idea, again, it's oversimplified and kind of taken out of its sort of contextual moorings, has an unsettling, or can have an unsettling echo of the providential determinism that John Smith described in 1630s, that God willed this, and those people disappear. Again, historians not meaning to do so, it kind of inadvertently echo that there's some kind of predetermination of what's occurring. Um, so uh, this is an example of one of the more kind of uh, um, aggressive or, or racist d d dimensions of the old explanation. It comes from Cotton Mather, who's actually really interested in immunology and contributed later to protecting against smallpox, where he writes, the woods were almost cleared of those pernicious creatures to make room for a better growth. And Jones is saying, by oversimplifying the virgin soil's idea, we run the risk of replicating in some fashion that idea of a predetermination of these disasters. <clears throat> so let me first you know, kind of review that, and like, what have we learned in the last 50, or last 20 years about revisiting virgin soils? Does it have any real merit? And if so, what are those merits? I would present to you, I would argue, that there is a, a modified version of that uh, does hold. That there, there is a real dimension of immunological uh, vulnerability for indigenous peoples, but you have to put lots of asterisks around it and really contextualize it. So here's what I mean. Number one. When we say that indigenous peoples were more vulnerable to these pathogens, especially smallpox, but also several other uh, respiratory viruses, what exactly do we mean? Are we talking about the humoral immune system, your spleen and your lymph nodes? Are we talking about your cellular, cell-mediated uh, immune system? Are we talking about your innate immune response or your um, uh, adapted immune, immune response? What are we actually saying? I think a big piece of the puzzle, because you think about it, what do you mean, why would a European who came in contact with smallpox have a lower death rate than an indigenous person coming in contact with smallpox? It doesn't make any sense. Either you have antibodies in the cellular immediate response, or you don't. Or it can be passed down um, from, from mothers to newborn children, but that only lasts for a few months. So what do we mean when we say that Europeans were more protected or indigenous peoples were less so? I think a big piece of the puzzle that has come into focus is variola minor. Variola major is the terrifying disease that was wiped out. Um, one of the things that we human beings have done, and it's a good thing, to eliminate smallpox. When we say we eliminated smallpox, we eliminated variola major. This is the disease that the mortality rates range, as we'll see, from 15 to 60 or even 80 percent uh, terrifying pathogen. Variola minor, however, was definitely, or probably, I should say, circulating in Europe from the 2nd to the 17th centuries. And I suspect that this has a lot to do with why Europeans, until the 17th century, didn't worry that much about smallpox, including variable major, which was circulating in Asia and in Africa. They didn't worry about it, I strongly suspect, because they were protected from it by getting variable minor. So, this the, the, this, the orthopox virus family, it's sort of weird to call viruses families, but the, the, this kind of virus is very stable. It has lots of crossover protections available. Right? So, so you, this is the origin of vaccines, vaccines themselves. It's cowpox. It's not smallpox that you're given. Variola minor has about a 2%, had about a 2% fatality rate. It's still a bad disease, but by the early modern standards, it's not nearly as bad as variola major, and it is very likely that it granted crossover protection for Europeans for a long time until the more deadly form of the disease circulated back to Europe and began to displace plague as the most terrifying virus. That would explain a lot. Number two, it is definitely possible that in Eurasia, in, in Europe uh, and in Africa and in, in, in many parts of Asia, there were more respiratory diseases that were spreading in general, which, let, which selected for or, or, or over, the, over the generations would, uh, would give improved cellular responses 
versus humoral responses. So that in the, in the Americas, where there almost certainly was not present variola minor or major, or a number of other respiratory viruses, you had more uh, uh, fungal infections and other kinds of infections that actually would have improved the humoral response, but not the cellular mediated response, which might have made indigenous peoples more vulnerable, not because there is not a powerful immune response, but not the correct kind of immune response. Finally, there is, it's possible, or indeed likely, that variation in blood types had a lot to do with fatality rates. So for example, um, in the 1950s, when a, right before a sort of worldwide campaign to eliminate smallpox was launched, again, a great, one of the very few like, great human success stories, uh, a study indicated from India indicated that those with type A blood were five to seven times more likely to contract and die of smallpox than others. Which indicates that the type of blood you have, which is about the antigens you carry, naturally has a great deal of effect on your response to, to different pathogens. Now, this would not explain the situation in the Americas, where large numbers or percentage of indigenous people were type O blood, but it is certainly possible that the greater variation in blood types among Europeans would have changed the nature of the impact of a disease, including smallpox. Okay. So the first part of the virgin soils theory is, I mean, it sort of holds as long as you're realizing that there were other kinds of diseases that were spreading in Europe that were caused crossover protection and different variations in the cellular response that would have allowed Europeans to die at lower rates. What about the thing about smallpox itself? Was it actually smallpox? Because, I mean, sometimes they say smallpox, sometimes they don't say it. We as historians are always wrestling with translations. The translations from French or from Portuguese about Smallpox or measles is often not inexact. Um, as you can imagine, many Europeans were not that interested in or engaged with indigenous sources, and therefore they sloppily described what was occurring. In any case, how do we know it was something else besides smallpox that caused these diseases? Most recently, uh, there's been a new theory about the 1616 to 1619 epidemic among the Wampanoag peoples of Massachusetts, what is now Massachusetts, a infection of enormous historical consequences. So literally when the pilgrims, Puritans, began to arrive, they arrived right after a devastating epidemic, right where they landed. The traditional idea was that it was smallpox. But there's a new theory by a number of doctors who were really doing good work with indigenous sources that it's actually probably leptospir leptospirosis, which is a bacterial infection introduced by European rats and not, and not smallpox. So there's definitely cases where the smallpox did it theory is, doesn't hold water. It's just, you know, there was other pathogens that were involved and that were oversimplifying things. However, there is no question in my mind that smallpox was, in fact, the major killer. There is just too much evidence from devastating outbreaks that are well described by multiple sources, whether it's in Mexico, Brazil, Massachusetts, uh, uh, Carolinas, or in Vancouver Island in the 1770s and 80s, that it was smallpox that smallpox did, in fact, wreak enormous havoc, far more so than among European societies. And so the question still comes to us, um, this image from the especially oh, horrific Cherokee outbreak um, in what the English called parts of North Carolina, there's no question that smallpox was behind huge yeah. numbers of indigenous deaths. And the question, therefore, remains, but why would the fatality rates among indigenous communities be so much higher? than even in the more isolated European populations. So for example, Iceland. When Iceland would get hit by smallpox, you would have 40% fatality rates, but in among many indigenous peoples, including the Salish and others, the death rates were double that. How is that possible? I think to get to that, which is different from why you would have gotten smallpox, because we talked about it in terms of like not being protected from variable minor or, or other pathogens, but why was the death rate so much higher? I think there the answer might be that we need to think more about the clinical progression of the disease. Instead of trying to like dip our toe into epidemiology, we should think more about nursing. What happened, past tense, when someone got smallpox? Well, what happened, um, so here again you can imagine, so there's a historian writing in good faith, they just say, so smallpox came, smallpox is really contagious, so that's it. Contagious is, is a sloppy word. What do we mean? Exactly how is the disease conveyed? 
and exactly how can it become deadly as opposed to simply making you sick. Um, many people who got smallpox died in the first few days. A lot of kids probably who got smallpox died before the pox broke out, so we almost certainly undercount smallpox deaths in places like London. Kids who were described as dying of the tremors actually had smallpox. But probably a majority of the people who died of smallpox did not die in the first couple of days. They died in the second week of their infection when their rash, forgive the graphic nature of this, began to slough off, leaving them extremely vulnerable to secondary infections. Right? So our immune system, the first thing of our immune system is the skin itself, to protect ourselves against the environment. And huge parts of the skin fell off during this part of the infection. Lots of people starved to death when they had smallpox because the pox had into their mouths, they couldn't swallow very well, and if someone isn't nursing them to sometimes actually mandibly take up their tongue and make sure they drink something and eat something, they'll start to death. Which means that, and of course, all this is happening when the person is shedding enormous amounts of virus, right? Smallpox is highly contagious, but it's more predictably contagious than something like COVID. It does not have the explosive dimension, it doesn't have pre-symptomatic spread, it's pretty predictable who's gonna get uh, smallpox. Um, most people who got smallpox, so in, a, in, a, in the 20th century, someone's in a house with someone with smallpox, they had a, about a 50% chance of getting the disease. Smallpox patients are intensely sick, right? They're not like super spreaders at karaoke bars <laughs> during COVID. They're, they're prostate, they're lying down. So someone has to come over and like lean over if they're in the range of danger, uh, aerosols or droplets, they'll get smallpox too. And then they shed virus for weeks. They shed virus in... in after the point when they're really sick. All which is to say is, to reduce the mortality rate of smallpox, you have to have, an, you have to have in a population large numbers of people who had already had the disease, who were unafraid of the disease because they already had it. You had to have nurses of various kinds who took care of patients who were intensely ill, who were unspeakable to look at, whose mouths were hanging open, who gave off a deathly smell from their, their dermis, which was dying, uh, to nurse them. And if you did have such people, the death rate would go way down, considerably down. And, and cultures that were in contact with this disease got better and better at handling it. Most especially many West African societies who not only knew how to do inoculation, the form of the vaccination, but also had a very intricate sort of clinical way to treat someone with smallpox. They used the Akinproba bark to give a basically like a fever reducer, and they, their death rates went way down, right? Indigenous peoples, had none of these things. They had no experience with this disease. There are a number of healing practices among indigenous societies that would have been helpful for every other disease, which would have predisposed multiple people in the community to get infected all at once. There's no flat curve. There's no one to take care of people. Large numbers of people would have starved to death. Large numbers of people would have died of secondary infections. Large numbers of people who otherwise would have survived if there had been nurses or nursing available died. And I think that goes a long way to, ex to explain these horrific uh, death tolls. And there's one other factor, and that's measles. I think this might be the, the other big key to things. So measles, as I'm sure as you know, is an incredibly infectious, uh, contagious disease. The most catching disease, probably, of all. Um, considerably more so than even the most advanced uh, forms of Omicron. Um, a reproduction rate estimated at 16, right? so one person with smallpox needed to, with measles to give it to 16 people. It's so astonishingly efficient at infecting people that a person with measles who walks through a room, which might occur, uh, people can get infected up to an hour later just by walking into the same room because of the aerosols, the, the incredibly small viral load is necessary to get a measles infection. Unbelievably infectious. Not normally understood in modern times as very deadly, but this is a major misnomer. And it's a major factor, I think, in these historic epidemics. So here's the deal with measles. It's not just the extreme contagiousness. It's that measles itself targets the T cells, cellular immune response. It destroys the, one of the most important parts of the cellular immune system. In addition, it causes such an explosive infection that people become viremic, or they get viremia, which means there's, there's viral fragments all over their blood. It produces an incredibly strong immune response. Your immune system, the part that survived the initial attack, goes and kills any parts of your tissues that are infected with the measles virus, which is everything. Which means that it basically induces 
a term uh, uh, introduced in 2012 called immune amnesia, similar to an HIV patient. For two to three years after a measles infection, and measles is still with us, in fact, it's, gaining, it's coming back because of lack of vaccination, a person has, is essentially like starts from zero in their immune system because of the nature of this particular infection. Kids who get measles, if you don't, if you think of just the, the death rate for measles, it's very small. But the mortality rate for kids who have had measles infection for the next five years goes up between 30 and 70% because they die of other things. They die of other infections that they otherwise would have fought off because measles has wiped out their immune system. In addition, in a process that I, I certainly do not understand, and I don't even epidemiologists are like, I don't get it. It's something really weird. What occurs with measles and peers is that the virus, which causes, it's a very strange way to an evolution. Like, why would a virus induce a powerful immune response to itself while wiping out your immune you need to everything else? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a called the measles paradox. The other thing about it that's paradoxical, although maybe it's related, is that it appears to become more pathogenic, more deadly, more serious in a population with a similar MHC molecular profile, major histocompatibility complex, basically just like the, what's, what did your immune system have ready in its arsenal to attack other viruses? Because it does that, in a population with a similar blood type, indigenous people's alpha having blood, uh, the O blood type, it is very likely that it would become more pathogenic as it spread through the community. What I'm telling you is that what I strongly suspect is that measles raged through indigenous communities like wildfire, severe, probably becoming patho more pathogenic during the actual process and making people far more susceptible to a secondary infection, including smallpox or including the flu, or including any of a number of kind of infectious diseases. So you see this, for example, in Hawaii, where measles was not, did not exist until missionaries brought it in 1871, um, the year after there's a huge number of deaths from whooping cough, which otherwise would not have caused a wave of death. Why did it cause a wave of death? Because measles had wiped out the immune system. So that's my kind of take on the virgin soldier visited. It is a useful concept, it has real meaning, but we have to be very careful when we're talking about what you mean by immunological uh, susceptibility. We have to think about things like variable and minor, and we have to think about the ways that diseases progress in the human body, and therefore the society can react to it, which might explain a lot of why there's differential in death rates. Okay, so as I talked about as in the beginning of my presentation, um, oftentimes when Europeans described what was happening to indigenous peoples they came in contact with. They used the word plague, some kind of plague, as if some kind of plague. And in our own minds, you know, we've got use, we were talking earlier in the, in the graduate student lounge, we used the word plague to refer to like COVID, like, oh, where were you when the plague started, right? Like it's become this sort of term for like any kind of bad illness. Um, that is not, of course, what Europeans meant. When they said plague, they meant plague, bubonic plague. Uh, which until the Ariola Major came to Europe and started to wreak havoc mid, late 17th and the 18th centuries, was by far the greatest terror in what they call Christendom in Europe. This is, um, sorry, I can't make it larger, I, I don't dare make it larger, uh, an image from, from 1869, so it's later, but uh, if you can see, so I find it's one of the most frightening images um, of art that I've ever seen. So here is a destroying angel indicating or pointing, telling plague, that's plague right there, to hit that house, hit that house, hit that house. And you see the human devastation uh, around you, around him, around it. You have this situation where, obviously in the 13, late 1340s and 50s, when something like a third, perhaps half of Europeans died of plague. Um, you have 1665, when London is devastated, 12 to 15 percent of the whole city destroyed, killed, 1720 in Marseille. Um, it is not some kind of vague reference. When you say plague, they meant the bubonic, or even more terrifying, the pneumonic plague. And I suspect there's something about just the, short, the sheer nature of death to plague that just weighed so heavily on European society and cultures. Um, we were speaking last night, uh, Didi, maybe about uh, in the Paris, if you ever go to the catacombs of Paris, under Paris, there's just um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of yards of skulls. Half of these skulls died of 
died of plague. It's as if like the bodies like way down the society itself. Um, equally terrifying and perhaps more pertinent, given that it's happening during colonization in America. This is St. Mary's Close, my vote for the creepiest place in the entire world. Um, Edinburgh. This is a place that's just like a grotto where people who had plague during a terrible outbreak in the 1640s um, uh, were uh, told to go or forced to go, and they died there. And it's become now a kind of idea of like this, this place is haunted. The place itself is sort of fundamentally death. You know, it's not life, it's death. So this is happening during the period of, of English colonization, of, your, of English aggressions into the Americas. Um, Shakespeare, who was a minor investor in the Virginia Company, um, lived through five different plague outbreaks in London. His theater was routinely shut down because of plague outbreaks. Um, his hometown, um, Stratford on Avon, suffered a plague outbreak when he was born that killed about a fourth of all the people in the town. So then, you know, so I, I've taught this so many times, and then it's like, well then, what about in America? Well, why did it come to America? What if plague had come to America? Why did it come to America? Because if you, I, I sort of have my um, students in the class say, okay, I don't normally ask you to do this because I don't want you to be like shopping for shoes or whatever, but like Google right now, plague in America, or like <laughs> bubonic plague in America, and you see what you get. And you're going to get, you know, that's not a thing. That's the biggest non-story I can imagine in American history. The plague did not come. Why didn't it come? It didn't come because the way, if you're the ferocious um, uh, bacteria that causes plague, your, your cinia pestis, a disease which can cause you know, people who, get, who got plague, who still get plague, um, can have fevers of up to 42. See, I'm American, 108 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, 42. Um, you know, terrifying symptoms and mass death, right? If you're your city of pestis and you want to spread, which all bacteria do and all, all, all viruses do as well, you need rats. You need, you need rats. It's not efficient human to human. It needs to be through rats. The fleas will then basically bite the rat, uh, become infected with plague. The plague bacteria will clog up the, the flea's gut. The flea will basically be like starving to death and will frantically jump onto any creature it can find and bite them and then spit huge amounts of bacteria into the new bloodstream. You need, you need infected rats. You can't have infected rats though because the journey is too long. You know, the Atlantic Ocean becomes the sort of ultimate uh, sanitary cord in, in, in world history. The rats get the disease, they all die within a week. You can often see in artwork about the plague, there's like dead rats in the background. That was like the terrifying premonition of about to be a disaster among humans. A week. Two weeks for the rats to all die. If they pass it to the humans, another week or two, and the most people will be dead too. It's too quick. You can't get across the Atlantic, right? You can get possibly through parts of the Mediterranean, um, and it is possible that there were ships, just ghost ships, that never made it to port. I, I don't know of actual specific empirical examples. But I certainly heard anecdotes, and my medievalist colleagues assure me that this actually occurred, where there were ships. Plague broke out in the Mediterranean, everyone died. And the ship just like, uh, does it sail? I just sort of drifts in the, in the Mediterranean. It's possible that it happened in the Atlantic, but they never got to the other side of the Atlantic. Here is the examples of where the British people, English, especially some Scots, went from 1607 to 27, a period when there was repeated plague outbreaks in London. You would think that plague would hit your eye, but it never did, or it never, it never made it. With one exception. So as you can see, of course, Bermuda, as is known as Summer's Island, is like a week and a half journey closer to Europe. It's also possible, common for English ships to stop in, in Madeira or the Azores. So if you, if you go from here to there and you time it just right, if you're the bacteria, or just wrong if you're a person, well, we can imagine this happening. This did happen. The month before the Mayflower sailed to New England in Massachusetts that had just been widowed by leptospirosis or another pathogen, a month before then, a ship called the Joseph landed in the Summers Islands, or Bermuda. 
And here is the archival source. I'll tell you, I want to hear your responses to it, what you think was going on here. First of all, should we believe this? Should we believe the former governor when he says, yeah, the ship arrived and um, the people were, in his exact words, very crazy to get off because there was plague. I think this is credible because of the amount of plague that was going through the time. I'm trying to find now the, the records of this ship leaving and trying to figure out, really deep dive it and figure out if it's, you know, if they were out of place when there was an outbreak. But I find it credible because I don't see why this governor would, he had many reasons to not say this and to suppress the news of the plague breaking out in this colony. I suspect that it's probably true. The ship arrives, it was described as a supply ship. Any guesses as to what the supply ship would mean? I, I think that might be about wheat. Europeans still wanted to have bread uh, in the Americas, and they were disappointed to find so much corn and potatoes, or they didn't want that, and wanted bread. And wheat is a great place, uh, the grain's a great place for rats or fleas to hide. Even the bacteria itself can travel in that context. So it gets to, the, to here. In uh, August, uh, August 1620, and um, the people were very crazy to get off the ship. According to the governor, 25 or 30 had already been thrown overboard during the voyage because they were dead of the plague. And uh, so what are you going to do here? The governor's predecessor, because the people on board included some important people, rode out to greet this ship. And there were several other canoes that went out to like greet the passengers who were again clearly eager, motivated to get off the ship. They get on the ship, they come to shore, which is to say they rode to here or here, and uh, a week later several of them fell sick. Plague had come to America, or it had almost come to America. But then it died out. Why did it die out? Why did the bubonic plague not take off? Because if it had taken off, I think American history would be a lot different. Because it's easy to imagine that it would have gotten into the rodent population. In fact, Bermuda had been overrun by rats in one of the grossest events in early American history only five years earlier. If it had gotten into the rodent population, it's very easy to imagine it getting from the one week voyage to Virginia, then wiping out the Virginia colony, whereupon the, co the company's investors who were already leery about what was going on in Virginia might have pulled their money. What's the point of having a colony that's going to get wiped out by the plague? So why didn't it happen? So here we have to just sort of go with, um, you know, forget that we were historians and just try to figure it out some other way. I consulted with a paleoecologist and was like, what do you think? You know, wh why would the plague not get, why would it not have gotten more on shore? And he said, you know, the first thing to understand here is that they didn't have any wharf. So a ship could not pull directly into harbor and get tied on. If it had tied on, the rats run down the lines at night, and then you got new rat population. Okay. They didn't have that. So you have to dock off of the shore. And this is, you know, Bermuda's people are afraid of the waters already. So they would have docked about 250 yards off the shore and then been rowing. That is itself, like, probably the biggest reason that there wasn't more plague brought on by the Joseph to Summers Island. But then, but then some people did get sick. And there had been these rats here earlier. So how did these rats get here, not other rats? And there, I think, the only explanation is that by the time that Joseph arrived in Bermuda with all these people who were very crazy to get on board and with people dying or dead of the plague, the rats had already died of the plague, or they were certainly sick. So again, talking to a, a, a rat specialist, I was like, how far can a healthy rat swim? <laughs> and you know the answer is sort of like, what are you doing? Are you like, a, no, no, it's, it's, it's a legit historical question. Um, they can swim quite well, actually. Uh, they could certainly swim. That certainly would explain how the rats had gotten to Summers Island earlier. So actually, it was like a pirate who was also involved in early slave trading, who must have, who definitely docked off the, the uh, of Summers Island in 1614. Healthy rats, you know, hail hardy rats, jumped off the ship and swam to Bermuda and overran Bermuda. It's a truly disgusting situation. Uh, there are so many rats swimming, swimming between these islands that the fish that were caught in these years were you know, bloated with rats. They had eaten so many rats. 
So a healthy rat could have made the journey, but they're not healthy rats. They were all had plague. So a sick rat would not have been able to, according to the rat expert that I, I said, would not have been able to swim the roughly 250 yards across open water where there was wind and waves, they would have drowned. And that saved America from getting <laughs> bubonic plague. And I really feel like that's a big non-event because if you scour, uh, there's also a question of what kind of rat, so if you really get into the weeds, it's like, don't just say it's a rat. What, if, what, what kind of rat was it? Was it a black rat known as ship rats? Or was it a Norwegian rat? Um, so again, my students in Montreal, I say, the, the, the rats we have here in Montreal, I won't speak for Kingston, maybe you're in a better rat situation here, but those are Norwegian rats. And that's good from a play perspective because Norwegian rats are big and mean and they don't like people and they stay away from you. They don't like, they're not scared of you. But they, 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 they. Black rats uh, were small and cuddly and they were like closer to people and they dominated in Europe until the 18th century. And it's definitely related to why there was so much plague. All right, so part of our thanks to why plague went away is because the Norwegian rats, kind of like Vikings, drove out to black rats, thereby making a better rat population for us. In the Bermuda situation, though, it almost happened. Because there were black rats, that had, ratus, ratus, ship rats, that had bubonic plague, and it got to 250 yards offshore, and it actually even got onto land. So the people who got sick, the, they, were, they were like in the, they were rowing the people, and a flea must have jumped directly onto them. That, that, oh, that's rare to happen, right? So you can't get a big outbreak that way. Um, but it didn't spread. It, that was it. And plague never again crossed the Atlantic, ever. If you scour the historical archive for plague in America, all you'll find is the situation in Bermuda in 1620, and in 1665, when there was the devastation of London, the other closest colony, Barbados, put up defenses. They, they put up a pest house. They imposed a really big uh, embargo on ships. They were really scared of the plague, the plague coming. That never came. Or never made it. And this, I think, is of immense historical importance. Because there was no plague, because there was the bubonic plague devastating the population. And I mean, you know, another way to put it is, when the English started colonizing the Americas, the population of England had only recently recovered from the 1340s outbreak. I mean, it's, 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 it's as if history stopped for 250 years. And, you know, it's that level of completely different history because of the plague. But there was no plague in there. Plague never came to the United States until 1900, and then it came from the Pacific. It never had an effect in early America. And as a result, I think it gave rise to or contributed to uh, this and, and other events, an idea of America as uniquely healthy for the settler population, and therefore distinct both from the indigenous peoples who were dying of various plagues and from the Europeans who were always dying, or had always died of plague. So let me conclude this way. I don't mean to give a suggestion that early America was healthy for the settlers, or that it was healthy in general. Obviously it wasn't. It brought these horrifying old world, if you want to put it that way, or, or uh, Eurasian and African diseases, which devastated the indigenous populations. Of course, it was extremely unhealthy. It was radically unhealthy, apocalyptically unhealthy. For the settlers as well, they are all happy that they don't have plague. Sometimes they'll refer to, like, isn't it great that we don't have plague here? This must be a chosen land, because we don't have St. Mary's clothes. We don't have those mountains of skulls like they do in Paris. Right, but many other diseases came. The most obvious one that's most distinctly American is yellow fever. And if smallpox, by that I mean very old major, is certainly connected to the early slave trade, yellow fever is entirely about slave trade. Yellow fever has no business, had no business escaping the West African um, uh, uh, monkey population in which it was basically quarantined for most of history. The disease is extremely hard to convey. It has to be through a particular kind of mosquito for a particular time of their 30-day lifespan. It's very, very hard. It's not a disease that should be able to travel. The only way it was able to travel was because of the immense wave of human trafficking uh, that began in the 1640s. 
course, African slaves were brought to Virginia as early as 1619, but that's in very small numbers. The first time there's a large, a large number of enslaved people brought in once is to Barbados in the 1640s. My best guess is that August to September of 1647, one of these vessels arrives. Barbados, unlike Bermuda, had a wharf. So people pulled directly into harbor. You probably can't see, maybe you can see on the side there. So this is Bridgetown. It had very early natural harbor to this day. You, ships can move directly into the middle of the city. There's a plaque there now for the survivors of the uh, slave trade. So ships can come right into harbor. They came right into harbor and infected by remic mosquitoes flew out of the ship or out of the water caskets and began to seed yellow fever cases. And it, it's like a biological bomb going off. Um, yellow fever cases, unlike smallpox or COVID, obviously, is very localized. So wherever the mosquitoes can fly, in those places, the attack rate can be, which is to say the percentage of people infected can be 100%. Literally everyone gets yellow fever, of whom anywhere from one-third to two-thirds died. Right? This didn't happen in Europe. This was an American thing. Um, and yet, and yet, American colonies, including Barbados, somehow pulled off a reputation for being healthy for the white settlers. Right? And I think we should just kind of pause on that and consider something about the colonial period in general and realize that it is just not an org in the English context, certainly, it's just not an organized imperial effort. It's a series of plantations that were at odds with each other in many cases, were competing with each other, which were funded differently, which were perfectly fine to have allies among the Dutch, occasionally with indigenous peoples, uh, occasionally even with West Africans, but not in an imperial context with each other. They were competing with each other, and they didn't want each other to get the ships. These places needed the ships to keep coming. And the ships would not come to a place where there was a known outbreak of a terrifying disease. So the archive for this devastating yellow fever epidemic in Barbados is incredibly small. It's small and it's suppressed. Right? So the governor just, just hush it up. There's been some problems, but it's not. Nah, 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 there's very little. You have to dig at it to find that there are these outbreaks. Different colonies begin to name them about other colonies. Yellow fever was not called yellow fever until 1752. Prior to that, it was called Barbados fever by people in Philadelphia and people in um, Grenada and people in other colonies who wanted Barbados to have fever ships coming. As such, for this reason, and because of the lack of the plague, there's a powerful, I don't know what the term is, ideology, just message, advertising that America was healthy that the planted populations were inordinately healthy, much more so than Europeans. And both as a result of the factual basis and the lack of the plague and this sort of desire to suppress information about things like yellow fever, you had this strong message, let's say in 1680, that the American colonies were healthy for English people. As of 1680, here is the best guess of, for census information purposes for the settler populations. I, I put the term free slash Christian slash white because those terms were often used interchangeably, especially Christians used. But to give you a sense, like we're not talking here in the Barbadian context about the large number of enslaved people, right? This is, the, this is what you got from the English perspective. Who is in America? Who, 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 where are our plantations there? How big are they? Virginia, the oldest, has 44,000 people and probably about 2,000 people of African descent. Massachusetts has 40,000 people, and that's, you know, the, the number was, is incredible growth. Barbados has 20,000 uh, free people, or Christians. They had about, by this point, 25,000 enslaved people. Right? But Barbados is the third largest, yeah, and it's by far the biggest army. It had a large, powerful militia. If you're thinking in an English imperial sense, people began to do at this time, Barbados is right up there with your settler populations. Connecticut and Maryland are both 17,000 or so. New York, recently acquired from the Dutch, is 10,000. New Jersey's 3,000. Just to give you a sense of the scale, right? Barbados is right up there with a large, apparently healthy, uh, white population. Beginning in 1685, again entirely because of the slave trade. From 85, 1685 to 1703, Barbados suffered every year either a smallpox outbreak, burial invasion. 
a yellow fever outbreak, or both. And it had considerable amounts of lead poisoning from people drinking the rum that had, uh, that had painted, uh, that lead on, on the painted side. This devastated the population, both the settler population and the enslaved population, and it causes a shocking change 20 years later. Virginia is now 59,000, Massachusetts 56,000, Maryland is, has doubled, Connecticut has doubled, Barbados has dropped to 17,000 white or Christian people. I say this because I would say that around this date, there begins to be a sub-variant of that ideology or that messaging of America healthy. It's North America is healthy. The islands, that's the tropics. That's the torrid zones. That's diseased. That's where you go if you'd like to die. That is where, that is a quote, white man's grave, a term used by the 18th century. The North American colonies, that is the promised land. Free of plague. Free, mostly, of smallpox, because they have very little minor. Free of other kinds of devastating outbreaks that had repeatedly devastated European populations and that we're expanding at incredible rates. Here is a rough example of the nations of Eastern North America by 1750, among the places that became 13 colonies. You can see also, of course, New France. Um, the English population, especially in the north, northern colonies, where it has been said they basically invented grandparents. Very rare for an English person in the 17th, 18th century to know their grandparents. They're dead long before they grow up. In New England, it was common have grandparents because the longevity was so much greater. By the time 1750 rolls around and someone like Ben Franklin begins to do these calculations, the ideology or the belief in North America's unique healthiness starts to become an argument for North America's distinctiveness. This text, Observations Concerning the Increase of Mankind, is a quite interesting, hard to pin down text. He has a, I'll let you use an adjective, sidebar, where he says like, so what do we mean by white people? And then he sort of writes, like, well, I don't mean Italians. I don't mean Germans. I mean white people. You know, like, and he's sort of like talking to himself. And he says, pure white people, in his terms, which basically is like English people, some Scottish people, though not like Highlanders. You don't mean Highlanders. English people, Scottish people, and then, you know, the settlers here were definitely white. It's quite an uh, interesting description of the history of whiteness. It's also an empirically driven analysis of the astonishing demographic performance of the white population, indicating and then becoming known that the white population of the, what we're soon to call the 13 colonies, was doubling every 20 years. A rate of growth four to five times more faster than England, which is already having a major population growth in that period as well. Um, and it's something to be the profound background story to well, could these, this place ever be an empire of its own? Which Franklin also begins to wonder about. Not in the same sidebar about white people and pure white people, but about if there's going to be more English people here on this side of the Atlantic than on that side of the Atlantic, well, what, what does one do about that? And he says, well, it would be a great increase to the power of the British nation. But that was when things were okay between the settler populations and more or less the empire. By the time of the revolution, you have images like this. I want to be clear. I don't mean this exact image. This exact image, which purports to show George Washington uh, here overseeing his plantation, which, as you'll see, is producing wheat, not tobacco, which Washington was very big about. This was actually done in 1851 as a way to stave off civil war, because the 1850, there was this this controversy of the, the, the almost secession of southern states because of the, uh, before the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act. This was an, an effort to kind of like calm down the sectional tensions by, by portraying slavery as another kind of farming. Nonetheless, the image is very, is, is powerful because 
the idea of it, which is of a bountiful place where there's lots of children, and there's lots of wheat, and there's lots of room for growth, was dominant or prevailing in America, or I'll say available in America, by the 1770s. Which is why, beginning in 1775, 74, 75, when the idea of independence actually becomes a possibility, rather than an impossible, unimaginable thing, it was possible to imagine for American colonists and settlers because of their immense confidence in the healthiness of their land, their land. Because of their belief, backed by Franklin's numbers, in the unique fruitfulness and healthfulness of this particular place, North America, and not of any other place certainly not of Europe, and certainly not of the Torrid Zones and the other colonies. When we think then about the history of disease and history of epidemics, about the apocalypse, I, I hope what we can take away from it is that it's important to turn the rumors into more accurate narratives. It's, it's important for us to understand better by employing, uh, by talking to rat specialists and talking to epidemiologists and talking to nurses to get a better sense of how diseases run through history and how humanity runs through diseases. We're always trying to pursue, um, as social scientists, humanists, social scientists, I suppose, um, facts. We're trying to build, we're trying to get rid of rumors of apocalypse and understand what happened, what occurred what might have occurred, what were the parameters of the possible, what were the particular details of this outbreak or that non-outbreak. And obviously I'm invested in doing so, I think we should keep doing so. However, I also think that the final you know, sort of takeaway from studying the rumors of apocalypse and the, the reality of apocalypse as it has occurred is to be reminded of our most basic human characteristic, which is vulnerability which is not strength and vitality and room for growth and power, but our immense vulnerability to the microscopic monsters that are back among us. I think that by better understanding how people have interacted with diseases and diseases with people, we can perhaps therefore be reminded uh, of that common human, out, uh, human uh, 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 trait, which is more important, I think, um, than using the latest technology to get a better factual read which is more important than um, even the most advanced deep dive using whatever kind of machine learning we can get. Um, it's something that I think that, it, I, something that, I think that in, a, in a period where we struggle in academics and academia to find commonalities, um, that's something we can all agree is not just um, important, uh, but urgent. Thank you very much. history and, and classics, Italian Renaissance was okay. related. That was uh, an amazing talk. In fact, um, after hearing you speak, I feel much smarter. <laughs> Sorry, I had to pull. Uh, what's, where's, where does syphilis fit in? Yeah, so syphilis, is its usual idea here is that syphilis returned from the Americas to Europe um, as distinct from the, the, the balance of diseases going the other way. There's been some evidence of late that actually might have been the case that syphilis actually might have been present in parts of the Mediterranean world prior to contact. But when syphilis certainly returns um, to Europe um, by, the late, by the 17th century, certainly, if not earlier, my kind of take on this is that there you, you get a pretty, um, a fairly elusive archive about that because of the, of the nature of the, of the contagion, because it's sexually transmitted. And while it has large-scale impacts later on, especially in the 20th century, the early impacts to me seem to be muted by this sort of like moment in, in European history when bubonic plague, by far the greatest terror, begins to be displaced in the sort of psychological dimensions and social dimensions of Europe by variola major. Right? So variola minor is like slowly being circulated out and variola major is small coming in. In that context, so like late 17th century, syphilis, although certainly a, 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 a new, almost certainly a new, in terms of its scale, 
um, threat seems to me to be uh, relatively modest or, or, or muted in its in the response of the culture, at least for the time being, um, and certainly in England. I, I know less though in the Mediterranean context, and that context it might have had a larger. Does that understand that it's a larger? Yeah. Does it come from the New World? Yes. Well, I mean, so the, the, the traditional argument was that yeah. it did. There's some new evidence that syphilis might have actually been been circulating in the southern Mediterranean world prior to contact, prior to the Columbian exchange. Um, but there's no doubt that far more syphilis cases were returned or, or, or circulated back to Europe because of, it definitely was circulating in the Americas prior to European arrival. So, but my sense of it is that it's relatively um, minor in its impact on the society at first because very old major smallpox was so dominant or so newly alarming to Europeans who previously had just blown it off because, you know, smallpox is like a small problem compared to plague. That's because they had very old might. But does it affect the immunity situation of indigenous peoples? Oh, oh, that. It's coming in that direction. Sorry. I'll no, 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 no. That, that's a very good question. Um, it certainly would for, for those who, who, were, who had chronic, who had, who had syphilis for periods of years. But the number of infections would be relatively, I mean, I don't think it's enough to sort of explain, um, I don't think it's enough to explain um, the huge differentials on that kind of scale. That's a really interesting thought that I had not, I had not considered it. I should say too, there's also interesting, interesting, troubling work being done um, using so skeletal and dental remains um, of people in most notably Barbados, right? And those people who are in uh, who, are, who had been being studied, the vast majority of them would have been enslaved, right? Because they weren't in a grave separately, which are often churches. And there, there is the possibility of being able to to um, detect. The rates of syphilis uh, among these among these enslaved uh, peoples, and in some cases they do range in the fifteen to twenty percent, uh, which would certainly be a major part of the health, the un the unwellness of that population. Sir, hi, uh, uh, Jeff Collins, history. Um, very interesting. I love all the detective work. Um, I was curious about your explanation for the decline of white population. In that 1670s, 80s on, there's far less demand. In fact, you can see some of the, the planters in Barbados are actually described, like, I don't want any more Irish people. I don't want any more white servants. And they'll use that, that phrase. However, I'm not sure that the, there's a slightly muted effect of that population because that population overwhelmingly did not form families. So it's like four to 5,000 people. Um, they also died at incredible rates of, not, not malaria in Barbados, they died at yellow fever and huge rates. So I think that the number of people who have been there uh, certainly affects the population, but what seems to be, to me, more dramatic is looking at the, the live births and deaths, which we have examples for, there was a radical, sh a dramatic shift in the 1680s because of smallpox and yellow fever. And that really eats into or um, reverses population growth, even as that four or 5,000 people who had been a kind of like, ex if not excess, but they had been a population that was not reproducing largely leaves. And of course, it's also the case that once people begin to say the term Barbados fever, which is coined as I, as I believe by the Pennsylvania governor who hated Barbados because they were mean to Quakers, um, because the Quakers wouldn't fight for the militia. Well, you're not going to go to Barbados. You know, like there becomes this whole thing about who's going to go to a place where you will die, or you are very likely to die. Jamaica becomes this in the 18th century, and there's a, there becomes this sort of sense that the people who go to Jamaica are you know, crazy because they are going to a place where their death rate is so high, their potential for becoming wealthy is entirely dependent on their brutality towards these like, people, um, but that the death rate is so high that who's gonna go there? What settler population is gonna go there? Um, it's, I, I, it's a really good point, I, I should model it more carefully. I'm just struck by the live births and live deaths, which isn't that related to the, the stock service. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, it's, yeah, I like that book a lot, but it's a thing where I think there's, there's a complicated politics, too, about the status of Irish people, especially on Barbados. Um, so some of them were probably referred to as, quote, unquote, bond slaves. They seem to have been like POWs in a lot of cases, and some of them were called servants. How many were there? Were they, quote, unquote, enslaved? And it, I mean, these are difficult questions, but I will say one thing that definitely did not happen to them which happened immediately to West African women, was that they, their babies or any of their children were not enslaved, which always happened from the beginning on Barbados to West African women. Thanks for that. That's really important. Hi. Such an interesting talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Wood. My name is Manny. I'm just interested, I mean, your work like clearly intersects with different fields and consulting to these questions that aren't necessarily historians. So this may seem kind of like a historical question, but I'm just wondering about um, how much you've kind of engaged and discussed with physicians and nurses about, for example, the virgin soil yep. yeah. of narrative and how it kind of, I, I think from kind of maybe anecdotal conversations with some of them, like how this infiltrates contemporary discourse within kind of the field of medicine, mm -hmm. how they engage with patients, how, for example, you know, these certain perceptions and conceptualizing in certain communities as potentially, you know, uh, uh, um, just how that kind of, yeah. kind of endures. Yeah. Know, and how, if you've considered that, and, and if you have, what has your experience been? Yeah, no, I have it. And so my, thank you, Beth. My, my general sense is that, um, so in speaking to, like, infectious disease specialists, they, when you, if you give them the, like, the simplified virgin soils, theory, narrative, they, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, well, you know, they wouldn't have the MHS, the MHC molecules, and okay, I get that. Um, they would be curious to say, like, well, do you mean, like, congenital, or do you mean that there's immunity that's not passed down uh, transplacental? They, they, but they're, they seem to be quite sensitive to the experience of a population, not just their antibodies, but the nursing practices the care practices. Are, is the population familiar with the disease or not? And I have been, you know, I guess, I've been, I was pleasantly surprised that there was, there was a response of sort of, well, it really depends on how people are, people are able to contend with the pathogen. Not a kind of, you know, are people's immune systems different? You know, it's like, no, no, people's immune systems are different only insofar as they live in a population where they get different kinds of antigens. They get different kinds of different kinds of illnesses. Um, the susceptibility, so like our certain you know populations, like pre under like they're, they're, they're prejudicial prejudicial understanding of certain populations. I think, I think there certainly is. I think there's also though um, the the kind of core understanding that um, the health of a population is so intimately related to the way they'll respond to a pathogen. Like so. So I'm just thinking of an example, um, in Brooklyn, there were higher rates of both reported uh, COVID cases in the first wave and, um, I'm sorry, wrong, uh, COVID cases and uh, deaths from COVID. And there's way higher rates among kids in those communities of asthma because they're living right next to a highway, right next to a highway. And so there's a good understanding I find uh, so far among clinicians that the way a pathogen interacts, and if you say what's the death rate or the, the fatality rate of a pathogen, they're pretty good at saying it depends on how healthy the population is. And the health of the population is, I won't say it's entirely, but it is a, it is a largely, it, it has a lot to do with political choices. It has a lot to do with the economic organization of society. And I have found, I suppose, I guess what I'm saying is, I've been pleasantly, I'm struck by the sensitivity to that and the understanding that pathogens wreak havoc in different ways, different places, especially in relation to how healthy that pe those people are prior to its arrival. Because it de it, that determines, more than anything else, how well um, people can be nursed, people can be cared for, before there can be real therapeutic interventions. So I was kind of meandering response, but, but th that's my overall sense. I also want to stress, I really think it's important for historians of disease to talk to nurses, because a lot of it has to do, new pathogens, 
the only thing to do is to nurse the patient. There's no, like, that's what one does, and it's extremely effective in many cases. I mean, it's not effective with like rabies, um, but it's often the difference between life and death in very basic ways. And so um, people who have a good understanding of the progress of the disease and the way a patient looks and, and seems is really important to get a sense of, I think. Um, and I found nurse to be especially good at describing that. Okay. Hi, uh, Jenna Healy. I'm a historian of medicine, half history department, and half medical school. Okay. So I love this. I really, really enjoyed cool. it. So I have two questions for you. One scientific, one philosophical. Great. Okay. So the scientific one is that, so there's a paper that comes out, I think it's 2019, I'm going to have to look it up, that posits that rats had nothing to do with yep. the life yep. yep. And how that then changes the sort of puzzle of Bermuda, yep. thinking that it was carried by a human ectoparasite, a flea that jumps yep. from human to human. Yep. And it just made me think of how many humans actually got off that ship. Yep. If it was crazy to unload them, yep. and everyone knows that. Very crazy. The exactly. thing to do, yeah. very crazy. Yeah, yeah. And the thing to do with plague is to run. That's right. Right? That's and right. so it's yeah. very possible yeah. that it just, the transmission died because they realized what was happening and they just abandoned mm -hmm. those people. So that's just like a... a no, that's great. Yeah, yeah. It. Even though I do really like the, the rats and the swimming and the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but maybe rats didn't matter. Yeah, right? yeah. Kind of or changes the story. Um, and then the philosophical one is, how might you respond? So obviously there's historians in medicine who really dislike this sort of um, using sort of modern scientific knowledge. And I sort of fall somewhere in the middle, I think. Right. It would be very interesting. Um, that you can't talk about our sort of knowledge of the measles virus now and the thinking about the sort of wiping out the immune system. Because the measles virus that existed in the 16th century is very different. It's yep. genetically different. It's just yeah. you can't talk about measles now, measles then, like they're the same. Mm -hmm. Entity. So I'm just interested how you would sort of like respond to that. Yeah, yeah. So in the first case about me, about about plague and and rats in 2020, there was a the year after that there was a, a really you know kind of like uh, uh, game changing article that. Is that the PNAS one, the associated the national. No. Okay. okay. So this in 2020 was the American Historical Review, okay. and it basically says okay, so here's the deal: using different you know, new kinds of genetic dating it seems that there was a big bang of the Yersinia pestis organism around 1100 in, the, in what is now Kyrgyzstan. And that what occurred there created and precedes and then explains this both like uh, um, uh, uh, actually tombstone evidence and others to say that these people died of plague. And that this strain is one that devastated Europe in the 1340s. What does that do with rats? The argument is it wasn't rats originally, there were marmots that were the initial carriers of this. Um, but then they got into the rodent population, and that the evidence for that, in terms of the proximity of the black rat, ratus ratus, to people at that time, is so much that it clearly got into the rodent population. And so, I guess I'm a convert to that to say, like, that there are cases. Iceland was devastated, and there were there was a big evidence that there was no rats there. So how's that? Well, it could have been pneumonic plague, which is even more like that's even more terrifying possibility, right? So there's that. But I I, I found it very convincing that. Many kind of rodents, to, now it's prairie dogs. So in the in American uh, West, there's like... Squirrels. Don't squir touch a dead squirrel. Dead squirrels. And, and, and in Colorado, there's cases, there's like 20 cases a year, and they're prairie dogs that, that, that are carrying plague. So many different kinds of rodents can carry Yersinia pestis. I was a convert to that. I, but it's worth noting, I mean, it's possible that this is like... Um, uh, uh, there's, you know, there's ways where, there definitely was ways where direct transfer from a flea, from, from a flea jumps from a person to a person and it turns into plague. Um, ask the philosophical question. I mean, I guess I would just put it as like, can we talk? Well, I, I definitely hear the point. It's crucial to understand that it's not only the populations are changing and that their MHC profile is changing. Yes, and the pathogen itself is different, right? So we were talking earlier too, the yellow fever virus, there seems to have been a particularly deadly strain that was imported from the Bijagos Islands to the Americas, ironically by abolitionists in the 1790s, and it's that strain that killed like 60% of victims in Philadelphia and Hispaniola. So the, the virus changes and the bacteria changes. Right, that's true. But are we to not apply the insight? So I mean like, yes, viruses change, but they, they change within certain parameters. You know, organisms change, they don't change into entirely different uh, molecular structures. They change, you know, peripherally, or they change um, uh, in ways that are somewhat ephemeral or somewhat um, in detail, um, I think that it's, I don't think it's like a duty, but it's like, of course we should apply, I, in my mind, it's sort of, if we can get basic information about the way that a pathogen behaves now. Um, 
in, the, in lieu of other bits of information. And especially in the case of like, if a measles epidemic wiped out or severely impacted the overall health, if not the exact immune systems, of indigenous peoples, and then another, pen, another pathogen killed such, those people, um, surely that's a, that's a thing we should consider and not sort of be, say, the details are too much for us to apply. The details are to be dove into, but I think that they should be, I think we should try. I think we should try to, 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 to account for what otherwise would remain uh, rumor and echo of disaster. I think the measles argument is actually really interesting and convincing, but I can, I can just hear some of my colleagues be like very cranky. You know, no, I, I get that. I wrote, I wrote a piece, okay, so there was, there was a somewhat concerning drop in measles for me. I'm a very, there was a concerning drop in measles vaccination rates for kids, at, I believe it was around Ottawa. And so I wrote a thing about this, and you know, some of the responses was, I, I noted that in this situation in Hawaii in the 1870s. And you know, yes, there are other explanations for this. Maybe measles was more, but sometimes those arguments themselves become really dicey. Such as, um, measles just tends to be more deadly among poor people. It's like, well, okay, what do you mean exactly by that? Or, and that's what your colleagues say, but like, others have, have, have told me, well, measles was like really deadly in Brazil um, to, you know, to the Brazilians, but it wasn't really to anyone else, to people who were, who, were, who were visiting. And it's like, okay, but I mean, what specifically do we mean by that? Is it because they were vitamin A deficient? Which might explain that. In the case of measles in Hawaii, how could so many people have died of whooping cough? It's possible, but the year before there was a devastating measles outbreak. It seems to me to not mention the possibility is to foreclose a real, a real possibility. Please, Sam. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so my question really is, is about how uh, the historiography part of uh, smallpox. Yes. So, from what I gather, I understand that Crosby's work, but I do like Crosby very much, yep. is the virgin soil, and that gets simplified. Yep. And Jones's work is yep. kind of really going against that and looking at the ideas that we undermine, all the other trauma, and all of that. Yes, yes. So, they both seem to me a rather polarized sort of both accounts. Yeah. Do we have any other historic historiography, maybe Fenn, or I'm trying to think of others who kind of balance and talk more about, because they both seem to me in a very polarized direction. Of Crosby, I do find balance, but I think it's Jones who says that Crosby gave ideas to Jerry Diamond and yeah. into this whole yeah. direction, which wasn't good. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. so that's a great question. So, um, I mean, as one note of that, Crosby was quite careful. He was like, he said that, I can imagine kind of regretting saying virgin soil. It's like, I, I'm saying something, but then it's also really complicated. Jared Diamond, who became very famous for guns, germs, and steel, and then people wrote back at Diamond one memorable op-ed entitled Hunter Blatherer about, about Diamond, um, saying you just took the idea and then just and then basically said, hey, you're, it wasn't, it's just smallpox did it. And then Jones is like, no, 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 no. That, if you say smallpox did it, that means that what didn't do it was like enslaving people in Hispaniola or direct murder or, yeah. and kill, you, know, you know, there's a whole, okay, so what are we gonna do about this? I actually find, you mentioned Elizabeth Fenn, I think she's quite good at saying, smallpox, this is a smallpox outbreak in the American Revolutionary period that burns through the Western Hemisphere, right? It kills 200,000 people. It devastated Mexico City. Um, she's quite good at saying, well, you know, it really matters. It, she was especially good about, about the nursing dimension. And saying, you know, like, it, it's not that an indigenous group would not have the same um, a powerful immune response. It's that if you didn't have people who knew they were protected, which they usually are, it's usually pretty during protection, then there's no one to nurse the people who are sick. And if people all fell sick at the same time with this kind of disease, people would die of starvation. They would die of thirst. They would die of a secondary infection. Um, so I would say Fen is a good... Uh, it's not like aiming in the middle. I was telling students, like, you don't get good information by getting in the middle of two debates. You get good information by getting good information. And she is, is just sensitive to all the variables that are not specifically microbiological, but rather um, the, the way that a pathogen interacts with the population. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, one, sorry. One, sorry, more sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. One, one more question. One more question. Okay, yeah, yeah. Hi. Last question. Yeah. 
Okay, um, I want to reopen the measles question. Yeah, sure. Um, I know nothing about measles, except for presumably we were inoculated as children without no memory of it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I'm wondering how does measles present in a person? Um, and then is there any like evidence of that in sources that are available from this time? And I guess tangentially to that, when we're talking about disease and we're talking about, you know, the use of plague and the kind of wishy washy like, this is a plague, but it's yeah. not the plague. How do we deal as historians with these kind of like the terminology around sickness and illness and there was this group of people who were sick in this way yep. and determining what that actually refers to in terms of our knowledge about pathogens or certain diseases, like is there a way of disaggregating, oh, we know for a fact that this must be whooping cough and it's not something else because of the symptoms or because there's been a continuity in terms of the way that it's discussed by authors or... It's an excellent question, and it goes also back to like if we, if, we, if pathogens change, so do so its symptoms, right? So there's, a, but okay, so measles, we for, which is a great vaccine for since 1963, uh, and then MMR 1969. Um, so it presents with you know a pretty dramatic rash. There's pretty symptomatic spread. It's incredibly infectious for the day or two before, and then it's incredibly infectious for the roughly five days that the person is really sick, and they're they're. Their face is covered in they're covered in rash. But okay, how do you distinguish that from smallpox? In the 20th century, so this is when you have really good information for it because there was smallpox around. It's fairly it was somewhat easy to distinguish between them because of the nature of the rash and like where the rash was and how deep it got into the derm and the epidermis or the derm. Um, so in the sources, it'll come up and people will say like variole for smallpox or petit variole, little smallpox for measles. But the big thing is that usually measles resolves itself, it causes all this damage to the immune system in a week to eight days, to, or a week to 10 days. So in terms of the sources, you do get people distinguishing between what we would call measles and smallpox, and it also chickenpox. Um, does it sort of skew, I mean, how can sources be used? I guess I would say that, very roughly speaking, as the 18th, in the 18th century, this, I'm more confident in the description of the symptoms because you, have, you had a more systematic description in circulation in the European world. So people would say, when there's smallpox, here's you know, how you know it's smallpox, and it'll last this long, and it's not to be mistaken for measles, which is possible to mistake it for, but Probably not if you're staying there and, and see what happens to people. If most people survive, that's probably not smallpox. And if their rash is generalized and really red and higher, that's not smallpox. So I think it's, it's, it's possible to disentangle, but it always comes with big asterisks. And I guess as, as wimpy as it sounds, like, you know, historians are always like, well, I think, I think good history has lots of sentences that have the word perhaps, or maybe, or it is possible that. I think that's a better way to go. And I think I intend to be more, we should be this in the additive way. And if we can get insights from, even possibilities from epidemiology and um, uh, genetic dating, we should apply them as best we can, always being sensitive to, it's just pretty remarkable how much the response of a, of a human body and a, a social body is determined by historical forces and historical contingencies, rather than by the like, separate or autonomous force of a virus, which itself is incredibly variable. Um, I meandered again from your question, but I, I hope, and I would say too, that the measles thing is really fascinating to me, especially because there's, I got this sense recently, before I wrote this thing, that like, there's this real way where measles has become, especially in the United States maybe, this sort of like, oh, that was like a thing in the olden day, you know, it really was not a big deal. And it's such a, I just find it to be an extraordinarily dangerous idea because that virus has caused immense suffering, especially if you look not at the death rate itself, but at the, the fatality curve or the morbidity mortality after measles infection. And the study was actually from a Dutch study of kids who had not been vaccinated. And the physicians were like, this looks like an HIV patient. This is, the, the immune system has been wiped clean for something like two to four years, as, as I recall. Um, and there's also a study in Japan, Japanese team also discovered, like, this is attacking the T cell. It's not attacking just the lung tissue. So I'm big on sort of like, if there's a disease we should like not forget about, it's measles.
Um, all right, I think our time is up. And on that, don't forget about measles. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, dead squirrels carry plague? <laughs>